This is an I Read Comic Books podcast minisode. I am your host, as always, but not always on the minisodes. I am Mike Rappin. With me for this very special minisode is Nick White. Hey. Thank you so much for joining me, Nick. I'm really excited to talk about this comic that we've decided, and the comic that we've decided to talk about this week is Ice Cream Man Volume 2. So for folks who have been listening to the show for a little bit of time, Nick and I covered Volume 1 of Ice Cream Man a short while back, and we decided, you know what, this series is fucking bonkers, we've got to keep going with it, so we're, we're going to cover the rest of the series as it comes out as minisodes, get ready for that, but for now, we're, we're talking about Volume 2, this is issues number 5 through 8, I believe, 5 through 9, it's a pretty short volume, right Nick? Uh, 8, yeah, 5, 6, 7, 8, yeah. 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 This is W. Maxwell Prince, uh, Martin Morazzo, Chris O'Halloran, and good old Neon in writer, artist, colorist, and letter order. And from the last time where we left things with Ice Cream Man, basically the town that they are in was falling into chaos and someone named Caleb showed up to basically put the Ice Cream Man in his place. Really, I had no idea where that was going. And issue five starts with, um, well, Nick, I'll let you get into it. <laughs> <laughs> fine that's fair um five is really disorienting i think obviously that's done very deliberately for people mm-hmm. who started to fall into a pattern not not unlike in the same way that when you watch twilight zone you're used to you know the theme song comes in and rod serling does the introduction and then you're led off to this tale which maybe is vaguely sinister but also vaguely moralistic at the same time uh, issue five just takes all of that and just throws it out the window and lets it just smash into pieces on the ground. Like this issue begins by saying, Hey, we're not in the suburbs anymore. This is taking place 30 miles outside of town. There's largely none of that introductory preamble that we tend to get, even though I think now it's been somewhat established that that introductory preamble has actually been ice cream man himself. So who mm-hmm. knows if you can trust that. And We just go straight fucking flat out into a scene of just unadulterated chaos, and it's really disorienting and weird, and it's basically like all hell has broken loose within this corporate sky rise, you know, skyscraper business of sorts, and, uh, you know, you have this guy who decides he's going to commit suicide from the roof. And so you mm-hmm. have this framing device of him falling past all of these floors, and at the same time, as the, as you go through the whole issue, you're intermittently checking back in with him, and he's having all of these different thoughts. Um, everything yeah. from sort of the mundane, to the stupid, to the oddly funny, to the actually somewhat, like, wise, pithy comments. Uh, but then sure. on the inside of the building... You're getting everything from a guy who um, is having a a vulture eat his brain to a guy whose innards are being gnawed out by rats. Uh, Ugh, it's crazy. Yeah, and I I mean, before we get too deep into the rest of this episode, I mean, full spoilers for Volume 2 of this series. I think Nick and I, in order to have a full discussion, need to spoil pretty much everything because there's a lot that happens in each issue, but there's a lot that happens in the overall volume um specifically this issue there's we're following a character named veronica um i mean even the narrator aka the ice cream man couldn't remember her name and it's it's weird uh because she seems to be the only sane person in a very insane skyscraper Mm -hmm. um and i mean it's I, i don't i didn't know what to expect it seems like after issue four um what seems to be the theme of this whole volume is that this little city has kind of fallen into complete chaos. Um, well, again, don't forget, this isn't up. technically the city. Not to be well, like, right, but, but it's yeah, the same, it's the same kind is. of thing. Like, you can, something is affecting these people to where it starts with a man, you know, jumping from a building to kill himself, mm-hmm. but what's actually happening inside the building is far worse in terms of, like, the insane things that could be happening. I mean, oh, I don't yeah. know what maxwell prince was trying to do with this issue um other than show that there is some fucking crazy garbage or fucking crazy stuff that's happening in this city and it's it's basically like 
every person for themselves and this woman veronica is trying to basically save herself and experiencing all of the strange things at once but she is miraculously saved by the quote-unquote hero of this issue which is this man named caleb who has started who i think throughout the rest of this volume makes very subtle or not so subtle appearances to try to save the day in some ways some more subtle than others yes yeah yeah yeah. and i mean it's it's a it's a really interesting beginning to this volume i mean i still think that this whole volume reads as like a nice anthology but to start this issue or start this volume with pure chaos like and oh, yeah. very fast-paced reading is is pretty bold i mean i i gotta lo- i gotta wonder what it's like reading this book month to month but oh yeah man oh man i was not expecting this i was definitely expecting maxwell prince to kind of do the thing where you fall back on what happened the previous volume where you actually built some story right because mm-hmm. if you remember the end of volume one you know the ice cream man is revealed to be someone else or something else and we don't know what it is and this character caleb this cowboy hat wearing motherfucker shows up and he's like your time is coming which is like why didn't he just settle it right there i don't know um that kind of becomes my question throughout the rest of this volume as well but uh like it's i kind of expected w maxwell prince to kind of do the thing where writers build up this very mysterious book and then they fall back on the um story quote unquote where it's just between you know the revealed thing that happened at the end of a volume and then the mystery and the fun stuff like this kind of goes away and it's no longer the focus of the book but starting with issue five in this volume that is absolutely not the case <laughs> yeah i mean i i agree with you that like there's sort of an like an is expected setup of juggling uh standalone episodic moments alongside like bigger longer story arc moments and i think with this volume that dynamic shifts a little i mean it's even disorienting when you consider that in issue five you don't actually Ugh, I I don't think I'm wrong when I say this, but you don't actually ever see Ice Cream Man himself, which makes it even more right. bizarre. Because at least in the first volume, when bad things seem to be afoot, uh, he's not that far away. And yet in this volume, right. you have this character, and as the issue as the issue goes on, and as the subsequent issues go on, you you see it more and more. You have this character called the Buzzard who seems to be present at a mm-hmm. lot of these things. And obviously that's, that's ice cream man or some ice cream man in some capacity or another. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I think is interesting then in that regard is that instead of seeing the ice cream man in every issue, instead we're seeing Caleb, we're seeing Caleb show up in some capacity and he's not necessarily saving the day every time, but he's right. always present um, in all the stories uh, with the exception of the Neapolitan uh, issue, which we'll get to. Uh, he is in that, but I'll tell you well, about that he in a is, little bit. He is, but it's he's not in the whole issue. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. I'll say that. But anyways, I mean issue five, what a wild fucking opening to the volume. Um I don't know, we can move on to issue six because Strange Neapolitan is probably the coolest story in this whole volume. Yeah, it's um it's almost like a shift back towards volume one in some ways, I would say. Mm-hmm. But then I think towards the end, it very much veers back into sorts of elements and tropes that this volume kind of comes to be known for, right? So, oh, yeah. uh, do you wanna do you wanna take this, or do you want me to sort of get sure, at it, I mean, or, or what do you want to do thing, here? This is a really interesting issue because it's three stories in one. And it starts with this man who goes to the ice cream man and gets a scoop of ice cream. And from there, there is this three-way diverging plot that is done in three separate colors. Like, it's a fucking genius thing. I don't, I've never seen something Can like I this in a comic. Can I just say, like, and briefly, really why impressed. is everyone always walking blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks after getting their ice cream? Like, doesn't that <laughs> sort of defeat the purpose of him having... Um, the ability to put ice cream on on wheels in a car but anyway go on sure sure i mean so we've got three stories that are going on here this Mm -hmm. and they all start with the man getting ice cream um in the first one he runs into a woman in the second one he finds an injured dog and in the third one he gets home and his ice cream is like infested with worms and each as each of the stories go on they tell like this very long form story and in fact later in the book or later in this issue 
uh, they do bring up the amount of time that's passing, right? So in the case of the first story, it's years. In the case of the second story, it's weeks. In the case of the third story, it's a day or days, maybe. And holy smokes. Uh, I don't know, Nick, what, what were your thoughts when you were reading this issue? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's there's a lot to dissect. I mean, I should briefly point out what Mike was getting at um, is that um, Martin Morazzo or, or whoever decided it um, has divided the page... Uh, into three vertical strips at this point. Oh, right, right. And um, I, the I believe that from left to right, it's uh, red, yellow, and orange are the three. Mm-hmm. The, each one has sort of a background uh, tone, color, palette, whatever you want to call it, um, that stays there uh, for the most part. I'll get into that later. This issue really lends itself to a lot of in-depth um, analysis. And so I'll just be referring to them with those colors in the future. But yes, um, red and yellow follow some pretty predictable um, narrative arcs that we've seen before in in other comics and just in general pop culture media um, narratives at large. Red is basically the, oops, man accidentally runs into woman, they fall over and laugh and they hit it off and date and get married and blah, 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 etc., etc., um, and yellow, of course, is guy who finds, you know, injured dog who appears to be lost and raises it and you know, they bond with each other and, you know, man's best friend, et cetera, et cetera. And then orange is just like, <laughs> orange doesn't follow anything. Uh, and I think there are reasons for that. But yeah, as, as you pointed out, orange, um, orange just gets really, really bizarre. And I think it's super interesting when you when you stop and look at it that um they each get um a triple three you know a neapolitan mm-hmm. of ice cream from the ice cream man and yet um when red as you know, I'm just like I said I'm just going to refer to the plots this way when red collides with the woman all three scoops of his ice cream hit the ground so he never has any of it when yellow finds the dog he tosses his two remaining scoops to the ground so he never makes it all the way through either, right? Which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I love this attention to detail. Orange is the only one to make it home without a distraction, and he's down to the bottom scoop, which right. he oh, finds I, out. I, the bottom scoop. I didn't even figure that out. Full. What's that? I didn't even notice that at yep. all. <laughs> yep. The other two just throw away the ice cream, or they knock it away. They don't make it to the bottom one. Yeah. Orange is the only one who manages to make it all the way down. Which is we'll right. find out is is um you know relevant, right right. So, uh, like I said, the first two plots tend to take their normal trajectories, and Orange just gets more and more bizarre. Like um, <laughs> yeah, that's th- to say the least. Yes, like Orange finds. I'm trying to remember if I have this right. He like goes home and he tries to make eggs, but when he takes his yeah. eggs out of the fridge, they have like bugs in them. And no, there's a, weird... a chick, like a, a live chick comes out of the egg. It's like a weird demon bird, demon chick. Well, I mean, right. ba- yeah. baby chickens don't look pretty. <laughs> this one still looked m- <laughs> it, yeah, weirder it did. It than did. it should have. I agree. I agree that. I agree with that. That or I'm just that far detached from nature that I'm like, what is that? And you're like, Nick, that's actually a normal. That's a, that's what a regular... animals look like. What the fuck? <laughs> that's just a regular chicken. <laughs> Nick, that's, Nick, Nick, that's a human. Um, Okay. <laughs> So uh, he takes it to, like, an animal hospital, and it just gets weirder and weirder. And then things inevitably go south in the first two arcs. Um, Mm -hmm. The child that the red plot line has uh, dies. And in the yellow plot line, you discover that the dog, um, someone is looking for their lost dog. Like, it's not just... The the dog isn't just drifting out there independently. Someone is looking for it, and there's a phone number on the sign, and please call it. And I think I could swear these missing dog signs actually go all the way back to the issue, I think, the one with the musician, which was what? I think that was like four. Um, It was issue three, I think. Okay, I could swear when he's walking home from the diner... These uh, those signs were on on um, electric poles, which I thought was oh, kind man. of an interesting touch. Um, yeah. So he, you know, has to deal with the fact that someone's looking for the dog, and he moves out of town, which is like grade A shady. Nice one. 
Um, well, I, I was wondering what kind of awful twist was going to happen because of this. Like, was someone going to hunt him down to fucking get their dog back? But right, I mean, yeah, yeah. And um, at that point, you almost feel like maybe all of these plot lines have sort of like leveled out. Like, sort of the ideas of karma and catching a lucky break or like these people had it so good and I had it so bad and then you mm-hmm. sort of feel like maybe all of the stories are evening out you know what I mean like to in terms extent, of yeah. people having you know uh, a good life and a bad life or whatever and then Orange ends up uh, getting chloroformed and thrown into a van and then you're like okay never mind this is still <laughs> This, right. this, this is, is the, the worst timeline. timeline or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I will point out um, there is a scene where they show all of these different plot lines walking through the park. And I don't know if you caught this, but the red plot has the junkie from issue issue two, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, ye- the yellow has the musician from issue four. And orange has the cowboy. And I right. don't know if there's a deeper meaning to those um plot lines having those people attached i thought about it for a bit but i'm not really quite sure um yeah other than the fact that some conclusions we'll have about orange in a little bit i think would make sense that the cowboy is in that one right yeah i agree i mean the when you talk about the evening out of the stories like you know story one uh, which is the i i miss what colors you labeled them as but the man getting married he meets this woman a child Red, they they have a child. The child dies in like a very graphic way. Like not like there's not like child murder or anything. It's like it right. gets sick, and the child dies. And this the woman, uh, his wife. You know, she falls into this deep depression. The man stays to care for her. They both kind of drink their sorrows away. That's the end of the story. And it's like okay, you know, that's bad. But like that's a normal bad. <laughs> and I say that because it's not ice cream man bad, right? Exactly. exactly. I understand. <laughs> Story two, you know, the man runs off into the woods. He lives basically hev- happily ever after with this dog, which is kind of nice, like strangely nice for this series. But then we get to issue or story three. Um, and well, uh, so many weird things happen. Like he walks to that park, he gets abducted, and then he's just in a basement and someone's talking to him in this mask in like a terrible chicken mask. And the guy stabs him in the leg and lets him sit and then like three days later a baby chicken comes out of the man's chest like i i don't know it's like the the worst timeline and i think to nick's point you know we see caleb um the cowboy in the park scene and to me i took that as oh this is the real scene because the other two characters were dead or gone or mysteriously you know didn't exist anymore because of actions and things that had happened in previous issues so my thought was those were quote unquote good timelines, and this was the one, the bad one, and therefore it's the real one. I mean, I don't know if W. Maxwell Prince is trying to say like, oh, there's a you know multiple timeline thing going on here. I don't know if he's ever going to come back to this concept, but I think what he was trying to show is like, here's what would have happened if the ice cream man wasn't here. Here are the options, you know. And the last one is like, this is what happens when the ice cream man continues to stay here. Um, I mean, they I know they all start with the ice cream and start with the ice cream man, but I don't know. For me, I thought, okay, the last one has to be real because Caleb was in it and he's trying to fix things in some capacity in his own weird way that doesn't seem to be really helping. But that was that was my thought. I I, and I honestly was so impressed with this issue. I I think it could definitely be nominated for an Eisner. Um, I wouldn't be surprised given the way that it was done because I think it was very clever. Yeah. No. No. I agree. Um, it it's very interesting because at the end of the issue, all three of them are sitting in chairs and the final phrase of the issue is just one way or another dot 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 which i found really interesting and i sort of went into this deep dive mode of like what is he trying to say with that Mm -hmm. um because in you know just typical english uh phrases and whatnot you would assume that it would be just like I mean, the common interpretation of, like, fill in the blank would be one way or another, blah, 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 happens. It sort of suggests, like, an inevitability. Like, one way or another, X is going to happen, or this is going to come about. So, like, uh, but yeah, how are you supposed to interpret that? Is it supposed to be the idea that they all 
Like, they all arrive at the same, like, outcome? Or is it the idea that one way or another, Ice Cream Man is going to end up with that bird thing? Is is that what we're suggesting? That one way or another, oh, he's maybe. going to get what he wants? Uh, is it is this one way or another meant to be just this... Uh, I mean, here's a real dim, dark one. One way or another, inevitably, things go south for everybody. I don't... <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know. I, know. I didn't know what to take um, away from that because that if they all ended in like a kind of sad, depressed manner, I would think that. But the second timeline with the dog, like there doesn't. The only bad outcome is that the man had to leave his town and leave his life. But like he I kept happy parsing that end. one because exactly, I was like, is there some depressing or sad thing that I'm missing here? Because right, I'm right. not, I mean, he had to move into the woods, but you fucking stole someone's dog. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, <laughs> my sympathy, my sympathy for that is, is a little limp limited. Um, well, my, my only thought hit there is, um, he stole someone's dog. Yeah. Therefore, the pain of something is no longer on him. Like one way or another, someone's going to be hurt. I think is the idea, right? If if you think of it that way, right? Like he's not the person that's hurt. The focal character isn't hurt, but the person who's looking for their dog and now no longer has their dog is now hurt, um, you know, emotionally. I think that maybe that's what it is. But yeah. I, I I don't know. That's it's maybe even a little bit of a leap. Uh, no, I mean with this issue, I I wouldn't I wouldn't classify anything anything as a leap. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I would, I would so fucking love it if like W. Maxwell Prince is like, I just divided it into three and assigned colors to all of them, and all of this stuff that you're reading into it is just ridiculous. Well, did you did you read this in trade, Nick? Like um, digital trade. I read it uh, in singles. I mean, okay, digital. So singles. in the back of the digital trade, he actually has a breakdown for that and explained like what the writing process was. Um, let me let me actually see if I can pull it up because. I think he kind of talks about the the story, um, maybe not in a, maybe not in a full capacity, but give me one second. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, and I've got some thoughts about the ending of the issue, which I think is kind of interesting. So I'll yeah, go for it. Bring that up before it's um, impacted by um, the real story. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting to me, at least, is that. And I, I want to look at this again, but I was when I was reading this a couple days back, I wrote this in my notes. So you'll notice at the end, the orange plot isn't actually tinted orange at the end. It's sort of blackish or brown. And and I wrote, are we meant to interpret this as the two as the true path? Because at the very end of the issue, we have a page of the three colors by themselves. I don't know if you had this page in yours, but it just has the three colors running down the page. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then. That page is followed by a solid black page. And I think we're meant to interpret that as the definitive answer to which one is the real plot, right? Um, so you have the three colors, but then they're followed by this black page, which with the orange panel getting tinted black, it's the idea that, like, this is the definitive final, you know, arc or story to follow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I, that's kind of what I, when I saw Caleb, I was like, oh shit, this is the real one. Um, yeah, I guess the, the back of the trade doesn't really have any explanation other than like, here's how I wrote this and described it to, um, Martin Morazzo as I was, uh, doing this. So still, what, what an issue. I, I really was impressed by it. Um, I don't know, find any final thoughts on that because otherwise we, let's get through seven and eight and talk about this fucking volume on the whole, because holy shit, this book I was. I made the mistake of reading it late at night, and I really shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that was uh, a bad idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, I I think that that sums it up pretty well. I I would be very curious, and I'm not so certain we've seen this in any of the subsequent issues in this volume. But I'm I would be very curious to know whether or not the events that happen towards the tail end of the issue, or the events that happen in the quote unquote real the real timeline actually bear any fruit you know what i mean like oh yeah well i i have some thoughts on this oh, from this next issue yeah sure so, absolutely so as as the story continues you know we go into issue seven um and this one is is a little bit i don't know back to basics i guess because it reminded me of stories from the first volume a lot, right? This is the issue is called My Little Poltergeist, and it's about this little girl who is seeing a 
she's supposedly seen the ghost of her recently passed friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and now mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I was like, oh, okay, we're introducing ghosts in this series. I was yeah, ready me for it too. because seems super like it would totally work. But um, her parents and uh, don't believe that she's seeing a ghost, and she's just writing little stories in a book, and we kind of see that as bits of narration um, mm-hmm. throughout the issue. And I mean, spoiler for the issue, obviously, but. It turns out she's not actually seeing a ghost. Um, she is making this all up, but that, but that's never truly confirmed. Um, I guess I, I my take was that something or someone was drawing her out into the forest, which is why she wakes up in the middle of the night. Um, so says, let's I guess have the, an adventure. Yeah, yeah. And someone says let's have an adventure, and so she goes out into the forest and she finds this cabin where motherfucking ice cream man is hanging out, and he's just got a flayed man. And my thought was. This was the person from the previous issue. Oh, he <laughs> calls him man? Jimbo. It's the musician. Oh, it's oh, it's the musician. Oh shit. Okay, I'm not tracking things unless he's developed weird nicknames for people that confuse them with other characters. Yeah, he calls him Jimbo. So okay, um, yeah. Okay, then I just I didn't get that. I, that's totally my bad. Um, yeah, I, I guess this this one, like I said, felt a lot like the issues in the previous volume. Um, where there's just kind of a, a story that's running and we do see the ice cream man and it kind of, it doesn't follow a formula, but it felt like more in line than the previous two where the other two were like really out there. This one just feels like a story about chaos that happens to a handful of people. Whereas the previous two issues were, uh, or I guess the previous issue, issue number f- five was like chaos is happening everywhere and we start to see that in issue eight as well um i don't know i feel like these things could have been released in any order and it would have read the same so i'm wondering if there's like some intentional um distribution in the volume or in the series where w maxwell prince is saying oh look here's stories of big chaos here's stories of small chaos and they're all revolved around the ice cream man to a certain extent um this but yeah this issue i i don't know felt like your standard what the fuck? <laughs> uh, at least that's what I that's what I mean. I I did notice that we are seeing the full the full goddamn monster now, like the ice cream man as he is, like in his form. I guess I I don't know. What I, I what are your thoughts on this? I'm I'm rambling now. <laughs> well, I mean, we can say we're seeing the full monster, but the truth is, I think we've we know him well enough at this point to know that he has taken multiple forms. But if you're saying that in in terms of like when he alters his appearance from being like the 1950s good humor man to being this reptilian motherfucker. Yeah. He's not exactly hiding that much anymore. Um, this issue was kind of like a swing and a miss for me in some ways. I think if anything, it was the one that I feel like had the most potential that it then decided to just ignore because I even wrote in my notes, I was furious. I was like, this issue has a ghost on the cover. There are no <laughs> yeah, ghosts yeah. at any other point in the issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, we don't... The thing is, we don't know what this little girl was hearing, right? There's no, like, second voice bo- box talking to her because we see her responses um, throughout the issue, but we don't actually see anyone or anything talking to her. Right. And, and it's, we don't, it's that I don't typical know if, dynamic of the kid who's talking to the imaginary friend and yeah, you've got yeah. that just a cliche idea that the one parent is like, this is something they'll grow out of. Let's not, I don't know, disturb our child's development yeah. process. And yeah. the dad is like, no, this is fucking schizophrenia. You're going to uh, the doctor and we're going to mm-hmm. have some uh, evaluations done. Um but yeah, you, obviously you have this issue where she goes into the woods and you've got these weird mangy wolves, which I was like, what's that about? And she keeps having these visions of, um, like, what is it like? She sees the trail and it turns into sprinkles and she sees this dilapidated shed. But for her, in her mind, it's actually a castle. Um, and and maybe in some way that's supposed to be her still clinging to this idea or illusion that, you know, everything is sunshine and rainbows and her friend is alive and they're the best friends and whatever um, she continues to say. I will say, I thought it was very weird that we we end up seeing the cops from issue one and I believe a couple other issues as well. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because I think they show up at the junkie junkie car accident in issue two and in a few other ones. Um, And, I mean, not to nitpick, but, like, true crime podcast Nick found it very weird 
that the cops tell the parents that they can't search for the kid until 72 hours have gone by, which yeah. Yeah, the person yeah. in question is a minor. An adult can legally go missing because it's not a crime because they're an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, you have that right to just ghost people, n- no pun intended. Right. <laughs> um, but as a kid, like, the cops don't say, like, yeah, uh, 72 hours. be hours. back in three days. Yeah. So I... <laughs> I don't know what that was about. I mean, I guess it artificially adds tension, but like, <laughs> it's it's wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I don't One, know. Maybe this is in maybe in some weird state. That's a, I don't. I I found that very bizarre and and uh, curious. Um, I did think it was interesting that Ice Cream Man says that this girl's friend Kayla got quote unquote got sick with the bad music. And you see these kind of, um, I think they're eighth, they're chained eighth notes, music theory people come at me, bro. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, I think they were eight, were they 16s? I think they were eighth notes. Um, and what's interesting is I think they're most prominently seen otherwise with the scenes with Jimbo. Yeah. Yeah, where he's like, uh, I think where he's walking into the, he's like walking into the basement of his house, I think, and we see a whole bunch of those, um, you know, trailing, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, um, I, I one of the thing I did notice in this issue, um, is when you know the girl she gets into this cabin, she sees the spider and a in an eye. In an Just eyeball. the spider from issue one, and the eyeball was from another issue, right? Uh, um, where I think that the ice cream man was taking pieces of people. It's it's really bizarre. Like the when he's I talking, remember like, the spider. This... I'm struggling to remember the eye. Um, was the I mean, eye taken during the buzzard thing in five? Oh, I think. Yes. Sorry. Um, I was looking at the wrong part of my notes. Yes, it was. Yeah, an eyeball pulled in the in the giant that building woman, the woman who's actually fairly like oh that happened yeah 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 she's fairly complacent um, about the whole thing <laughs> i mean this whole this whole issue this whole volume is just full of little easter eggs from previous things like to link it all together like even the cops when they're talking you know they have a bag full of sprinkles that they're looking at after the girl has already seen sprinkles out in the forest like it's it's so bizarre like the way things are tied together because from the outsider perspective reading this it's like holy shit there's just like little droplets of things to link everything together left and right but um to see the people not believing things and being confused is just it's almost infuriating <laughs> to a certain extent uh but yeah i mean this uh, this issue is very much like plot developing i mean we've got this little girl we've got our little one-off story but they did do a lot to develop the plot i think um because we get an interaction between the ice cream man and caleb and we find out the ice cream man's name is ricardus did he call him that in the previous volume i don't remember i don't think so uh it's yeah i seem to have it in my notes that that is the first time i think at the end of volume one he's addressed as rick Okay, maybe that's what it is. And that's the difference, but I could have that wrong. The other thing I did find kind of interesting, and I think this was supposed to be meditated on in, in some ways, but I'm I'm a dense idiot, so I didn't quite get it. At one point, the narration in Seven says, every story is a ghost story. Did you catch this? Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what to make of that, but the way it was placed and written it made it sound like it was actually supposed to be something pretty important but i i i didn't know what to extract from that so i mean um, i didn't really take it as being too much i didn't take it as like a bigger metaphor for something um but i mean who knows this book is constantly surprising us with things so i wouldn't be surprised if that came up later um but yeah, it's it's. I, I think this also was like a a story about getting over the death of a friend, which is very tough when you're a young child. I think. Yeah, which in a lot of ways I think ties into. And I realize now I think I've been flipping issues three and four in volume one. I think three was the musician, and four was the guy having to give the um speech at his friend's yeah, um, the funeral. Eulogy. Yeah. So apologies to everyone who has been yelling and shouting at their. Um, 
telephone or whatever they listen on. Uh, I just mm-hmm. realized I think I've got those flipped. Um, but yeah, it's 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 similar in a lot of ways to that issue, and I would almost want to go reread that issue again because I almost wonder if there are more connections between the two that I haven't quite um, sorted out yet. Yeah, there's there's definitely something to be said about reading this book in quick succession. I think we've, we're going to do volume three, I think, as part of a mini-sode soon. And I think when I do that, I'm going to reread the whole series leading up to that. Because there's so many things that were tied together in just this volume with the last one that I'm like, holy shit, what's he going to do for the next the next four issues of the series? And I, I really want to make sure that I've got all that down. Yeah, no, but, totally. So let's get into the last issue in this volume this is issue number eight emergencies and it's about some emts in the most um unprofessional and <laughs> stupid story i've ever read in some yeah, ways yeah like, it's not exactly a uh, a lesson of uh, ethics and pharmacology no no yeah, it is not totally um i love how a the couple kaleidoscope things... page you know that foreshadows foreshadows this issue is of a yeah, dead yeah. clown and i'm like um <laughs> Okay, guys, let's uh, buckle in. This is a rough start. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny. The volumes, they put those pages at the end of the book. Um, what? Really? At the end of the issue? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of unfortunate. It almost um, makes you wonder if they sort of decided that those were maybe tipping people off and they didn't want that. Which maybe. which is weird because for me like it doesn't give away anything. It's it's a curious uh, curiosity peaking sort of thing. But anyway, mm-hmm. g- go ahead. I mean, the the only real thing that I had to note about this was that you noticed I noticed that the narration in this volume is done in two ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you get, there's a deep mixture between uh, Caleb, who I assume is the black captions, like mm-hmm. the black box captions, and then the ice cream man is our standard beige yellow with black text um i like that they split it up because it's we're getting new perspective on the narration and obviously caleb's outlook is a bit more grim because he's kind of like a reaper in some ways like he shows up in weird way i don't know like he when he showed up at the end of issue seven i was kind of like bummed that he didn't do anything he just says i'll be seeing you and like does nothing to the ice cream man again after running into him i'm, I'm kind yeah. of curious as to and what we, the end game and, is here sorry um and yeah and and we can discuss him in a in a little bit here because i think the character of caleb merits further um discussion Oh, and absolutely. Evaluation. This issue's narration with Caleb is all about, you know, pushing through and being together and bringing community together. I thought it was really interesting. It's kind of the opposite of everything that the ice cream man talks about. It's as if they're polar opposites or something. Um, but he, <laughs> he's got like a more harsh tone, whereas the ice cream man is kind of like luring you in with this very nice, fanciful way of writing. Um, Caleb's narration is very blunt and it's very like harsh in the way that it writes things i I like that a lot um to show that this complete distinction so that there's no confusion that this is a different character um doing the narration yeah you sort of have these two competing narratives going back and forth throughout this issue and um at one point they're talking at the beginning about like that there's this worst radio station of all time it only plays bad music uh, and we're encouraged by the narrator to ignore that voice because we're all we're all one, we're all unified, and I think that's sort of what Caleb is getting at. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, we're following this very bizarre plot of these two people in this in the um, in the ambulance, and they're casually taking medications they're finding, including chemo meds, which it's like, wow. Uh, and yeah. then when you're like, wow, this guy's an idiot, he basically implies that. Both um, uh, him and the uh, the driver uh, basically have been stealing drugs from the hospital cabinets. And it's like, wow. And they're just driving around all of this chaos that's happening in the suburbs. And, of course, we see the buzzard fly over before we start um, seeing all of this taking place. And they're just yeah. ignoring it. They're oblivious to it. Um, you have these weird stories where the driver is telling... Um, the uh, assistant that like she killed her her sister's like pet mouse or whatever when she was younger because the voice told her to do it 
and and then finally which is like really bizarre but i think it's obviously getting at this idea of whether or not you want to listen to or pay attention to these these voices or these uh you know the two little men on your shoulders in terms of you know what you choose to do with decisions i suppose um and we run across this clown and what i found really interesting is that so there's a dead clown right and one of the kids that comes upon him says that the werewolf from the woods must have killed him. Mm -hmm. And of course we know who that is. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Because we we now know, you know, from multiple instances that he turns into this werewolf thing in the woods um, and they decides he needs a burial. And so they toss him off a bridge. Yeah. um, Which is again, just this darkly comical image. Well, the, the, the thing to note here is that the clown is dead, but he's clearly been shot in the head. Right. And the kids are just like, oh, the werewolf must have gotten him. And it's, I don't know, this. there's something about the way that W. Maxwell Prince writes some characters. They're so, like, I, I don't know the word for it. They're just so laid back about all of the horrible shit that's going on <laughs> around them. Yeah. Like, these kids are just like, yeah. oh, look, a dead clown. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that won't be that one won't be performing at my party. Yeah, yeah, uh, unfortunately. Um, no, it's no different than the the woman and the at the corporate board meeting in in issue five who has her eye taken out and she's like, well, you know, um, that's inconvenient. Uh, same sort of thing. And but yeah, a- inevitably, these two um, from the ambulance sort of come to terms with how they've been acting and kind of snap out of it. Um, and the narrator says, uh, Caleb says, the real song, again, talking about this radio metaphor of good music and bad music and whatnot, he says, the real song is hard to hear because good things take work. And they finally, the ambulance driver and the assistant, they finally stop and they pick up someone for the first time. And it's the cowboy with a knife wound. And I think he was threatened with that knife at the end of seven at the altercation in the um, cabin in the woods, no pun intended. Um, Cause I think, uh, I think ice cream man says like the next time we meet, I'm going to kill you basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we end up with Caleb, Caleb being pushed into an ambulance and that's, and that's the end of the volume. Well, they didn't, um, they didn't pick him up. They had been driving around with him the entire, the entire time. Um, that was, that was what I read it as. Because really? They, yeah, because they were driving around, and then they come, and the woman goes, oh, no, the guy. And then she jumps out of the back, and she goes, shit, he's in the back. And then you see, we've been watching this heart monitor throughout the issue, and it's it's a flat line. Oh, um, well, um, you're probably right. Uh, honestly, yeah. this issue was pretty disorienting for me, and I'm yeah. sure another read would definitely help. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that happens. Like, there's chaos going on. There's these truckers at this diner that are stabbing their hands. There's, like, a polar bear chasing a guy down. There's houses on fire all across the city, like, across the suburb area. And then at the end, these ambulance drivers leave the diner after they've been tripping balls on all this random drugs that they've been taking. Right. And the woman, she's like, shit, there's a guy in the back. And the passenger is confused and they open up the back and, uh, it's Caleb stabbed in the neck. So I don't know what this means now for the series because I kind of thought this Caleb and Ice Cream Man thing was going to develop a bit more. Maybe this is the end of his story and we're getting like the final moments as Ice Cream Man is taking over. I don't know. I don't know. This is quite a wild ride. I mean, this volume on the whole, just to get into discussing the rest of the volume, unless you had more on issue eight, Nick. No, no, go um, ahead. This volume on the whole is kind of like, this city, this town, wherever they are, is really descending into madness, and everyone seems to be aware of it, and no one seems to be doing anything about it. That's that's kind of what I took away from it. Like, there's very few sane people left in the city, and we don't get to hear their stories, because everyone else, like the people that are starting a lynch mob, the people that are walking to this diner to rob it and then blow their brains out of the, the truckers that are stabbing their hands, like, they all are just kind of okay, this is what's happening. This is normal to them for some reason. Something has gotten to them. My guess is it's everybody that's had ice cream, but that's just a, a rough prediction for me. What are what are your thoughts, Nick? Yeah, I, I think as we discussed earlier, I think one of the things that really merits 
discussion is the character of Caleb. Because at the end of volume one, you're kind of given this idea of, oh, this is like the rival. He's going to put a stop to Ice Cream Man, or at least he's going to try. Um, and we'll have some inevitable confrontation and maybe even an altercation. And yet, as volume two goes on, Caleb is more of more of an observer than anything else. Um pretty much the biggest threat for most of this with him and ice cream man is this idea that he, uh, he tells ice cream man, I'm, I'm basically privy to everything you're doing. Like, I know who you are. I know what your name is, which as we know from any, any, um, literature, Rumpelstiltskin, et cetera, et cetera, knowing someone's true name denotes power. Right. So mm-hmm. of course it's, it's a powerful thing, but that being said, st- that being said, still, um, like he's just more of an observer. Uh, he usually shows up too late or after the damage has been done. He doesn't mm-hmm. seem to be that sympathetic uh, for the plight of humans. Much like Ice Cream Man, he seems to be above it. And any of these issues or scenarios or whatever really ultimately seem to be just about the two of them and everyone else just kind of they're there but but they're inconsequential he's yeah these two are are above everyone else so to speak which which i find that just i found that very interesting uh, especially um at least with eight you see this idea that well i would say eight and seven you see this idea that maybe caleb is becoming a bit of a rising threat um at least in seven he does hamper and thwart Ice Cream Man's plans very directly. Mm-hmm. Um, he does get the girl out of there and, and out of the shack and whatnot. Um, which, I mean, I guess perhaps makes sense when we see that in 8, he's obviously been hurt. So yeah. towards the end, we start to see the altercations um, ramping up, even though obviously it's happening off screen, quote unquote. Um, yeah. Well, we don't know who stabbed Caleb. That's the we thing. We don't. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we can make an educated guess, right? But Sure. But, but I mean, but I, you're I wonder not wrong. if this is I'm wondering if it, this is like a result of the chaos though. Because sure. it seems to me that like Ice Cream Man is an agent of chaos, right? If we're I'm trying to step back from the story and he's an agent of chaos and and chaos is okay to have, but I think that Caleb is there to put him in check to be like you're doing too much. And right, he's saying yeah. you have to slow it down, but Ice Cream Man is reveling in the fact that people are buying into this and just loving all of the shit that he's doing to a certain extent, right? Where he's, they're buying in and he's able to manipulate them so easily that he's like, right. I could do this forever. And Caleb is like, you need to stop. You need to slow down because there can be chaos, but just not that much. Which makes mm. me wonder, like, where's the bigger story here? And I, that's why I want to read Volume 3 so badly. Yeah, I, I think it's important to distinguish that Caleb is not really a hero. He's not even really, I would say, even an anti-hero. He's just more of a balancing act. And honestly, I think that's probably the best way of putting it. Totally, he just, yeah. He just brings, you know, bring things back to, like, an even keel, so to speak. Um, but he's not really a hero. Like I said, he seems very disinterested in, in, in human affairs. He seems to be operating on some bigger mission or something like that and we see him escalate i think because ice cream man especially in like volume one he's more of a trickster god archetype um he's more interested in sort of like toying with people uh and engaging in what the youtube kids of today call social experiments um (laughs) yeah Yeah, sure sure nick (laughs) you got pranked bro um for those who aren't aren't uh familiar with that terminology uh but in volume two it just morphs into outright sadism i would say and maybe there's a progression but it's it's less about um like in volume one I think Ice Cream Man is more comfortable with letting, giving people enough of, what is the phrase, Um, giving people enough rope to hang themselves with, or or however that goes. He's he's basically going to let you do yourself in, um, 
through through overconfidence or or hubris mm-hmm. or or bad decision making uh and he's there just to mostly uh, just sort of push it along a little bit and and then revel in it and then volume 2 is just outright just unadulterated violence much of it gratuitous much of it mm-hmm. seemingly um just uh like it's it's not like some of the other stories where we see people maybe overacting in terms of greed or overconfidence or hubris, and then we see them brought back down. Um, in volume two, it's people that, unless we know any better, they've done nothing to deserve uh, the fates that we see, you know? Right. And maybe maybe that's what this is all about, right? This is where Caleb is starting to step in to say, okay, what you were doing before is okay. When you're like giving yeah. on giving, some level, yeah, okay, yeah, giving yeah. people their comeuppance, your comeuppance is like totally fine. But in the case of just rando innocent folks, like in the case of you know the Neapolitan issue, which I found out that guy's name is Jeremy. That's what it's written is in the back of the trade, um, in the notes. But okay. um, Jeremy, you know, maybe he didn't deserve any of that. You know, he didn't deserve the torture that he got in the one storyline. Maybe he didn't deserve. Um, or anything with the weird chicken thing. Maybe some of these people, like the flayed guy, he maybe he didn't deserve that after everything else that, um, or he did deserve it, and that's why Caleb doesn't pull, you know, st- save the flayed man. He doesn't save Jimbo. Instead, he just saves the little girl who didn't deserve that. She was just going through a bad time. And like now, I've got ideas in my head about what this could mean. Like maybe, okay, the maybe the ice cream man is able to like sense people's depression or sadness or some strong negative emotion and then he goes oh that means you deserve to die and so he does something wild and crazy to kill you like it's some sort of demon um but it turns out that like in the case of the little girl right um kayla i believe her name was she was just sad that her friend was dead she doesn't deserve to die she just had this very strong sad emotion to which the ice cream man took as you deserve you're gonna die now because you've done something here when it's normally it's like people who have this Im- immense guilt or people that's, who have this immense regret or something like that and um the ice cream man for some reason can justify killing them it doesn't i don't think it fits in every of the stories in the first volume but i, I think it's still there like th- there's something about that like immense emotion causing um this connection to the ice cream man and caleb is like you're not you're not splitting them up you're not giving the correct punishment to the people that actually deserve it and that's where he has to step in but it's causing just absolute chaos in the city and i I, maybe it's just like throwing the natural order of things out of whack and now we're seeing this chaos like we saw in issue eight yeah i mean there's no denying that ice cream man certainly has a real knack for locating or honing in on people um at points when they're i guess you could say emotionally vulnerable and and um and preying on that although as you said i think there's a difference between how he treats them in issue up uh, sorry in volume 1 versus volume 2 um you know volume 1 is more about toying with your prey quote unquote um and sort of giving it a fair chance to sort of uh come out okay versus volume 2 where it's just just flat out violence you know right so. yeah so yeah this is a it's quite a volume uh, <laughs> yeah, how you no, like it so I'm, far, I'm Nick? very curious to see where volume three goes because the obvious implication from the end of, of volume two or, or even look at the end of volume two versus the end of volume one, right? Because the end of volume one suggests that you got this little jerk in town, basically um, some demigod who's running his own version of punked within the suburbs uh, and the end of volume yeah. one suggests that there's there's going to be a balance, there's going to be a reckoning, or at the very least, um, whatever supernatural deity exists that all of these are a part of, that he basically is going to, his, his chaperone has just shown up, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, and he's going to get sent to the principal's office of whatever the equivalent of this is in terms of Mount Olympus, I don't know. Right, right. But then with volume I- two, the ending is basically like, well... If there was a balance, uh, probably not anymore. Um, right, yeah. The balance is gone, and we're dealing with, well, I mean, just, just look at what Ice Cream Man just did in issue eight. Like, the implication is going to be that 
Volume 3 is going to be that, or much, 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 much worse. So <laughs> I'm I'm interested. I'm yeah, terrified, yeah. but I'm interested. Yeah, same here. I'm I'm very curious to know where this is going to go and when how it's going to end because I can't imagine this goes on forever. But I could see another volume or two or three even come out of this and have a very solid ending. So I'm really looking forward to doing volume three in this series. I I've, I've gotten all my predictions out for this for this volume because I need to know what happens. I just want to dive into volume three now. Yeah, no, completely. Same here. Well, I guess uh, I guess we could wrap this up. Um, since we're about in an hour, and holy smokes, there's only so much we could say without going in circles. So I guess you can follow us all on Twitter. You know, you can follow me and Nick on Twitter. Nick is at Death Star Plans. I'm at Mike Rappin. You can follow the show at IRCB Podcast, where I post all sorts of things. We're also on Instagram. If you're not following us on Instagram, I try to post some fun stuff there. We also have a website. That's ircbpodcast.com. We have our pronunciation guide there for um, comic book writers and artists and letters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we also sell our merch there. In addition to that, if you need to, you can email the show. If you have comments, if you have questions, if you have jokes, if you have something that doesn't fall into any of those three categories, you can do that at ircb at destroythesibe.org. It's also important to point out that this episode first aired on Patreon. If you are a Patreon supporter, thank you for supporting us. If you aren't, I would highly encourage taking a look at what our Patreon has to offer. It's all sorts of new things all the time. Special Doom Patrol episodes, early access to episodes. It's, it's well worth your money. Infinity Shred is the best band in the universe. They do all the music for a show. They have a new album out. If you haven't checked it out, you should search for them on Spotify or wherever you listen to music online. It should be out there. Xander is a wizard, also a very fun guy. He edits the show, and he's the best. I want to say thanks to Nick, and I want to say thank you to you, the listeners. You guys are amazing. So until next time, comics are good, and so are you.